All right, thank you so much, bro. I am very tall, so I'm going to lift the mic up. Um, it's so great to be back with my year up family. You know, I spent five years in the DC site. And for those of you who are my NCR family, there's some of us that I worked with today, they'll know that when I was doing graduations in NCR, I was always big on the chants. Like my LC always held it down on the chants. And I heard y'all chanting. And so I'd like to see how you guys sound relative to NCR from up here. So let me see if I can do your chant. Why you? Uh, that's all right. Why you? All right, all right, I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. Give yourselves a hand, you guys are pretty good. You guys are pretty good. Um, like I said, it's really great to be back with my year of family. I don't miss wearing these suits every day. Uh, we don't have to wear these at Google, but I put it on just for you guys today, and it's really an honor to be with you. Uh, the first thing I wanna do uh, is acknowledge that we are who we are because somebody loved us and supported us. Uh, and so year up graduates, let's first give it up for all those people in the room today who supported and loved you, your mothers, brothers, sisters, abuelos, abuelas, the mentors, the advisors, the learning community leaders, let's give it up for them. You know, I am who I am in no small part to the year up family, all the people who loved and supported me while I spent five years here in this organization. So I definitely wanna honor Gerald Tertavian, Rhonda Thompson, Dave Winder, and I got some of my fam with me, Meredith, Margaret, Kate, love y'all, appreciate all the support and everything you guys fed into me, so thank you. Um, now I'd like to talk to the graduates, uh, and I wanna talk to you this morning about belonging. You know, for many of us, as we came up, the people who loved us gave us our initial sense of belonging, our sense of identity. You know, I have three daughters now, they're 10, eight, and six, uh, and my youngest daughter, Zadie, when she was first learning to talk, she referred to herself as Mommy Zadie in the singular. And let me tell you, the breaking process when she realized that Mommy and Zadie were actually separate people uh, wreaked havoc on our family. But I wasn't one of those kids who found my people early on. In some ways, belonging has been a lifelong struggle for me. Uh, I grew up in a biracial family, so figuring out where I belonged was confusing. You know, my father grew up uh, only a few generations removed from slavery uh, in a small house in Everett, Washington with five brothers and sisters. And my mother, she grew up in this giant house. We used to call it the mansion. It was this seven bedroom English manor home on a golf course in the suburbs of North Seattle. She grew up with seven brothers and sisters and they had this kind of idyllic middle class white family that you would picture in 1960s television. And I loved my family growing up. I got 23 cousins, we always had a good time. But I noticed my older cousins on my mother's side as they were going off to college and pursuing advanced degrees, the cousins, older cousins on my father's side were struggling a little bit, taking a different path, hitting obstacles. So I literally, we talk about the opportunity divide at year up, I literally watched the opportunity divide open up in my own family. And for a kid like me, I didn't know which side I belonged on. Which side of that opportunity divide was my opportunity to own. And navigating a place of belonging in school wasn't any easier. I was a hardcore science nerd. Do we have any hardcore science nerds in the house? Let me hear you. I know we got some hardcore science nerds. Come on now. It's a year up. All right, I used to have these toys called Capsellas. Are any of you old enough to remember Capsellas? Nah, y'all are too young. Okay, this was like a 1980s thing, like something you see on Stranger Things. <laughs> these Capsellas, these Capsellas, it was like they're these little like plastic spheres. And they had gears and motors that you could put into them and connect into batteries, and you could make anything. It was super cool, like submarines, race cars, fans, flashlights. Like, you could make anything out of them. And I would geek out, and that's what I would ask. Every birthday, every Christmas, I wanted these capsulas. I also was super into, like, model airplanes, so I would, like, put them together with the glue, and then I would put the fishing lines, so you walked into my room, and they'd be hanging from the ceiling with fishing lines. So I was, I was definitely one of those hardcore science nerds. But I was also a bit of a jock too. I was the captain of my basketball team in high school. Uh, I don't even know if Slam Magazine still exists. Does Slam Magazine still exist? Yeah? All right, so Slam Magazine, I literally papered my entire bedroom wall with Slam Magazine cutouts. Like you couldn't see any of the wall. All you could see was, it was like Kobe and Kevin Garnett and all these people coming up through the 90s. And I had all these sports cards and stuff. I was, I was, you know, I was into all of that. 
Now, I'd like to pretend that I was like this self-confident guy who could kind of, you know, go back and forth between all these different groups and well-liked by everybody, but I was pretty far from the truth. In reality, I felt like I was a different than all the different groups that I was a part of. Uh, in every instance, I'd have to ask myself, what do I have to give up in order to belong here? And often the answer was, it's more than I'm willing to give. And so I would exist inside my own circle, kind of at the edges. And I dreaded lunchtime because I'd have to choose a table, and I didn't really feel like I fit naturally at any of those tables. And for a while, in order to cope, I told myself, I didn't care what other people thought. I'm sure some of you have sort of told yourself that at some point, I don't care what other people think, I'm going to do me. And as much as we might tell ourselves that we don't care what other people think, we know we do. We might think that we're steered by our own compass, but our compass actually tracks public opinion, not true north. And so when I was your age and I was tired of na navigating all these different groups, I decided to choose a side. Uh, they, uh, Brooke mentioned I went to the University of Virginia, I went to college in the South, and this was a school that had thousands of black students. And so I decided that I was gonna just completely immerse myself in the black community. I was only went to black parties, I only went to black social gatherings, I was leading the NAACP, National Society of Black Engineers, Office of African American Affairs, peer advisor program, I did it all. I won influence, I won friends, I won awards, I met my wife at the OAAA, we've been married for 15 years now, I got a lot out of that time, thank you. But I was also exhausted after those four years, and if I'm honest with you, I came out with zero white friends, zero white mentors, I had none. Uh, and those chickens came home to roost when I was sitting in your seat right now, ready to take my first job in corporate America, my first white collar job ever. You know, I was a newly minted management consultant and uh, I was going into these Fortune 500 companies and giving business advice. Uh, and part of the sales pitch from the recruiters was that this company was a meritocracy. I'm sure you all have heard that term a lot coming up through the year up. It's a meritocracy, it's about effort, it's about talent. And I knew I had talent and no one was gonna outwork me so I was good, right? No, family, no, I wasn't good. I struggled in that first job. I struggled mightily in that first job. And what I learned is that talent and effort matters. Of course that matters. But there's something even more important than that. And that was whether people liked you and whether you found a sense of belonging in those groups that you were trying to be a part of. And getting people to like me was a challenge that I was not prepared for in that first job. I wasn't disliked so much as I feel like people were maybe felt lukewarm towards me, and that was probably because I felt lukewarm about them. <laughs> and I also had a bunch of year ups, a bunch of programs that sort of helped me get a lever up, so there was a little bit of imposter syndrome too, like do I really belong here? Did I come the same path as everybody else, or did I get an extra leg up to be here? And all it was, took was me stumbling a couple times in that first job, uh, and I didn't have the mentors, and I didn't have the peer support, uh, and I didn't have people to back me up. And so within six months of that very first job, after I had graduated with an engineering degree near the top of my class, super successful, I was about to be fired. I was literally put on probation and told, if you don't shape up, you're out of here. Now, I don't have time this morning to tell you the whole story of how I dug myself out that hole. I also dug myself into some holes when I came to year up too, but that's a whole nother story, right? Margaret, Kate, Meredith, you can attest, right? Uh, but I did learn that my number one job was to negotiate a place of belonging on those teams. And I'm not gonna lie, I hated it. But I accepted it, uh, and I got mentors, and I start to build more peer groups, and I worked my way out of that hole. And the best companies will help you do that, but unfortunately, a lot of companies will put that burden on you. That's a, a journey you're gonna have to figure out. And the hardest part, as I'm sure many of you have already figured out, is that you're gonna have to change. You know, when I was on my very first internship, the president of our NAACP chapter in Seattle, Dr. Carl Mack, dropped some serious knowledge on me. He said, Jay Steele, to get something you've never had, you're going to have to do some things you've never done. And that extra burden isn't always fair. And if you're like me, it'll cause you some suffering along the way. You know, people you knew coming up, maybe even family, are going to say, man, he done changed, he done changed, right? I'm sure all of you are already getting some of that. And people at work might wonder why you can't just fit into the group like everybody else. But family, nothing, nothing is permanent unless it can evolve. If you're going to thrive, you've got to learn how to change. You don't want to be the blockbuster to the world Netflix, the MySpace to the world's Facebook. The, you, know, you don't want to be the Sony Walkman to the world's iPod. You don't want to be those things, fam. You've got to change. You've got to evolve. 
And I'm still going through those growing pains today. I'm, I got this big fancy title at Google, but every day I'm still trying to figure out how do you negotiate an authentic identity that feels true to you, but also allows you to find a place of belonging. And look, this might be easier if I was telling you to completely reinvent yourself and forget who you are, but I'm not saying that. I want you to hold on and embrace the things that make you unique. Don't become the same as other people, just find a place of authentic belonging. Your difference is your strength. Yeah, you're gonna have to suffer maybe a little bit uh, to, to keep that uniqueness, but this world needs your perspective, needs your courage, needs your voice. My lived experience empowered me to give $125 million away at Google to organizations like Year Up. I partnered with Brian Stevenson to build a lynching in America memorial in Alabama. I worked with Chance the Rapper to teach coding to kids on the south side of Chicago. Yeah, Chance just dropped his new album yesterday, if y'all have checked it out. You know, we did the same thing with Zendaya here in Oakland. We partnered with Zendaya to teach coding to kids in Oakland. And these initiatives all grew out of my lived experience, out of that struggle, out of finding that authentic place of belonging, and bringing a different perspective than most people at Google. You know, the world doesn't need another app to deliver pizza faster to us. We need your solutions to like stop global warming, reduce inequality, end urban gun violence. That's what we need, and you all got that knowledge up in here. <laughs> it's gonna be your lived experience going into those tech companies that's really gonna change the world. And what gives us the deepest sense of purpose in life is not this tensionless state, this sort of easy street, but striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal. So I'll end with this, lean into that tension, go after it, just make some, sure some people got your back along the way. And if you're at Google, I got you, so look me up if you end up at Google, I got you, okay? You're up, class 21, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you really ready though? Yeah. Why, you? Yeah. All right, let's go get it, congratulations.